each year on an annual basis, we analyze thousands of office leases across the country. And so whether we have doctors on the East Coast or West Coast, we have developed a very acute sense of what motivates landlords and why animal health practitioners and healthcare practitioners make wonderful commercial tenants. Last year, we represented over 1,000 practitioners. And there's really no other national firm across the country that represents as many healthcare practitioners as we do. And it's something that we're very proud of. Since our inception, we have negotiated over 12,000 office leases. And this is a pretty incredible fact, because roughly a third of our business today is basically intended to support doctors that are thinking about a transition or a sale. And so when I speak with an animal health practitioner that is considering the sale of their clinic or, frankly, the purchase of their clinic, typically the advice and counsel that we provide is that they really should be thinking about a transition at least three years prior to actually selling their clinics. I'll explain why in a few moments. Last year, we conducted over 150 educational seminars across the country and are often asked to speak at national conventions. And our curriculum and content is all race certified. We really are the premier healthcare tenant representation firm. Just a few facts. So over all these years of working with healthcare practitioners and, and veterinary and animal health practitioners, We've basically come to the conclusion that over 75% of the lease agreements that we review and analyze can prevent our doctors from ever selling their practices. And the statement basically is broad, but doctors ultimately means that there are provisions and covenants in your leases that can make it either very difficult for you to sell your clinic or can very significantly diminish the value of the practice. And the nation, which is wealth and estate protection, essentially means one very basic, simple thing to us. As you grow old and as your career develops, essentially what we are big proponents of is in preserving your capital and in ensuring that your net worth rises, and that ultimately, upon death, we're very big proponents in, in protecting the estate from undue liability, whether it's tax liability or finance liability or lease liability. And so the statement that you all see on the screen here today ultimately simply means that if you're thinking about selling your practice, the details in the lease agreement can either greatly impact the value by helping it significantly or by diminishing the value of the practice. Secondarily, we typically find that roughly 60% of veterinarians that we work with have extremely unreasonable personal exposure in their lease agreements. And what I mean by that, doctors, is that in my personal case, the overwhelming majority of leases that I personally review the veterinarian or the animal health practitioner has provided a personal guarantee to the landlord. And so basically, on page one of your lease agreements, you will ideally find that the tenant in your lease agreement is your corporation and not you personally. In parallel to that, doctors, what I commonly find is that not only do you personally sign off as the tenant in your lease, that you also then provide a personal guarantee or an indemnity to the landlord, further providing personal guarantees and exposure in the lease agreement. And so God forbid you're ever in a position where you default on the lease or you are in legal dispute with the landlord. When you provide a personal guarantee to the landlord, they have the ability to seek damages or sue you should if in the event you default or do not follow the terms and conditions and covenants within the lease agreement. Number three, it's amazing that at every lecture I give across the country on real estate matters for, for veterinarians or healthcare practitioners, I often have to remind the, the audience that 
you all make wonderful tenants for landlords. And landlords know that. And the reason being is because you have very low default rates. So veterinarians in the country have significantly lower default rates than other types of commercial tenants. Number two, you all make very significant investments into leaseholds, so leasehold improvements, um, very significant. And with respect to leasehold improvements, what most tenants don't realize is that they don't actually own the leasehold improvements, but the landlord owns the leasehold improvements. So if you, you are in the process of starting a, a clinic, a veterinary clinic, or you own a veterinary clinic, and you've invested a few hundred thousand dollars into your space with respect to plumbing or electrical lines, drywall, finished space, that ultimately that asset belongs to the landlord. Number three, there's no question, and we've been tracking and studying this for many years, that you increase foot traffic to the center as well. And number four, when you sign a long-term lease with your landlords, you absolutely appreciate the value of their assets and properties. So the purpose of today's webinar, doctors, is to talk about why the lease agreement is so important, specifically as it relates to protecting your net worth and your, 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 your assets, if you will, and secondarily, to ensure that your estate is protected upon death. Number two, as it relates to real estate and wealth and estate protection, that we're very big proponents in helping doctors design very custom-made leases specific to their career stage, such that if you're a young doctor, a personal guarantee might not appear to be a terribly onerous thing, but if you're a doctor thinking about selling in the next two to three years and you're nearing transition, then protecting of yourself against personal exposure in your lease agreement is essential. And thirdly, doctors, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the key terms within the office lease. And forgive me, the dental office lease is incorrect. This is specific to animal health practitioners. And finally, to provide you all with some practical advice on negotiating lease agreements. And so whether you are thinking of starting a clinic, buying a clinic, renewing your office lease, or you're essentially thinking about transition and sale, the lease agreement plays a critical role, doctors, in protecting your estate and in protecting your net worth. One of the most fundamental questions that we ask our clients and our doctors every day is a very basic, simple question. And, and that question is, what is a lease? And amazingly, what we commonly hear from a lot of our clients and a lot of the folks that we lecture to is that the lease agreement ultimately is a contract between the landlord and tenant that provides you with rights to the space and to occupy a space. And after many years of deliberation and debate at the firm here, what we basically realized is that a lease agreement is basically a check. It represents one of the top five expenses to the veterinary clinic. And very typically, doctors, what we find is that your operating costs, your base rent and your operating costs should not exceed 8% of the revenue of the clinic. So for example, if you're producing a million dollars of revenue and you're spending over $80,000 in your occupancy costs, your base rent and your operating costs, something is wrong. And very typically, I find that it's either a case where you're overpaying in rent or B, the practice, the clinic is not producing enough. Just this morning, I was speaking with a doctor in San Diego who mentioned to me that he's paying approximately $18,000 in rent. And when I ask this doctor, what percentage of that $18,000 is base rent and what percentage of it is additional rent, the doctor basically said to me, Alan, I have no idea. I don't know. We just write this $18,000 check every month and we hope that the landlord is being honest with us. And so doctors, there are two principal types of leases. There's a gross lease and there's a net lease. A gross lease basically means that you pay a value per square foot per month, and that incorporates base rent and operating costs, or common area maintenance charges. A net lease is basically comprised into a base rent value, which is a price per square foot, and then secondarily, a proportionate share of all of the operating costs to run the building. And unfortunately, what many doctors do not do 
that are net tenants, which, which presumably will be the majority of you on this conference, on this webinar today, is audit every couple years whatever your landlord is presenting to you with respect to operating costs. So hypothetically, if a landlord spends $100,000 to run a building, you as a tenant will pay your proportionate share of those expenses. Now, what unfortunately very few commercial tenants actually do is actually ask the landlord to prove that the $100,000 of expenses that they claim to be incurring are legitimate and in fact being expensed and paid. Why is the office lease so important to estate and wealth protection? Number one, very few commercial tenants invest as much as you all do into a small space. And it's very common today in the country when a doctor is setting up a veterinary clinic that they will spend anywhere from $75 to $200 a square foot just to build out the space. So they make very significant investments. And then ultimately, the lease agreement is essential because hopefully it's protecting that investment you made. A new participant has joined the conference. Number two, it's very difficult to move a practice or clinic. And what we've learned in all these years as well is that veterinarians are highly unlikely to relocate their practices because it requires a lot of money and it's very difficult to move the clinic with respect to your clients. Number three, it's very time consuming to move a clinic. Unlike many other businesses that can move over the course of 30 days, doctors, your business is not portable. And so the theme of the, the, the webinar around the, the, the wealth protection, if your landlord has the right to relocate you within 30 days, or terminate your lease if they sell their building, it will cost you a lot of money. And just for example, doctors, I was conferring with a doctor just yesterday who spent $600,000 to build a beautiful veterinary clinic on the West Coast. And within the first year of occupancy, the building where this doctor was practicing was sold, and the purchaser of the property had an immediate termination right and, and, and in effect terminated our doctor's lease. So you can imagine that the, 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 the risks in the lease agreement can pose a very significant risk against the protection of wealth. Number three, patient and client attrition. We've learned over all the years that again, if you have to move the clinic, you will lose clients. And so we've learned that it's a very significant investment, it's very difficult to move, it's time consuming to move, and patient attrition is a major problem. And then finally, for any of you that are on this webinar today that are thinking about selling your clinic within the next three to five years, the lease agreement and the location will have a very significant impact on the value of your practice. There's no question it will. If you have terms and conditions in the lease that basically are highly unfavorable to the prospective buyer of your clinics, they will use that to drive the purchase price down. And doctors, that is something that we experience every day. What are the benefits of a well-structured lease agreement? Number one, a lease agreement should provide you with fair and affordable financial terms. And what I mean by that, doctors, is you should not be overpaying in rent. It should be fair and reasonable. And fair market rent, which is a real estate term, which implies that your base rent is set using a number of variables and factors, most notably comparables. Ultimately, fair market rent means whatever landlords can get you to pay. And you should not be overpaying in rent. And there's a very easy way to vet that out, doctors. Typically, what we do is we run a real estate analysis on the zip code. We look at two years of historical data, and then we try to determine whether or not your rent is fair or you're overpaying in rent. Number two, the lease agreement should provide you with long-term stability and security. And what I mean here is that for all of you on this webinar that are presently commercial tenants, typically what I advise and counsel my clients on is they should be signing tenure lease agreements. If you sign a short-term lease agreement, and we have many, many clients or doctors that we work with that are adamant that they want to sign two or three-year leases, Doctors, what happens to rent 
every time you come up for renewal. It typically goes up. And so landlords are very amenable to short-term leases because they know due to the fact that your businesses are not portable and it's very expensive for you all to relocate, why on earth would you not want to have a long-term lease agreement in place? Number three, it should absolutely minimize your risk and exposure. And one of the most significant problems in the country today with commercial tenancy, specifically as it relates to veterinarians, is the fact that they personally guarantee their leases. And they provide personal exposure. So for example, a few weeks ago, we had a client that unfortunately passed away so the surviving spouse contacted our firm and, to our surprise, advised us that the landlord is now seeking the full value of the lease from the estate. So when you personally guarantee a lease agreement and, God forbid, the doctor passes, the lease liability transfers to the estate. And so upon death, one would believe that the liability would end, but unfortunately it does not. The lease agreement should absolutely maximize your flexibility. So for example, do you have the ability to run a boarding facility? Can you do anything you want to do in that space? And the permitted use provision in the lease agreement is essential that it be structured well to provide you with maximum flexibility. And the number five doctors, the lease agreement should absolutely enhance your ability to sell. And what I mean by that is twofold. Each year we're involved in hundreds of files where we're providing advice and direction to doctors that want to buy clinics. And when the young doctors or young associates are completing their due diligence, basically what they ask us to do is to look at the lease agreement and find risk and liability, and that ultimately leverage the risk and liability to diminish the value of the clinic. So is, is there a relocation provision, a demolition provision, is there personal guarantees, et cetera? On the flip side, we were involved in several hundred sales of clinics where we basically restructure lease agreements prior to the practice or the clinic being marketed. And just as a caveat here, doctors, on bullet point number five, the last person that should know that you want to sell your clinic is your landlord. The landlord should be the last person to know that you are in the process of marketing or appraising and selling your clinic. And typically what we advise is when you have secured a buyer for your clinic and you have negotiated a purchase and sale agreement, at that point do we notify the landlord when we navigate the purchaser through the assignment process. I want to shift gears now, doctors, for a few minutes, and I want to just talk about some of the major concerns and issues that are found in the office lease as it specifically relates to wealth and estate protection. And the first provision that I want to talk about is the option to renew provision. So the option to renew provision essentially provides for your ability to extend your lease term. And what I typically advise my clients to do is to sign 10-year lease terms and push for at least two five-year options to extend. And so in essence, if you get agreement with your landlord on a 10-year lease term and two five-year options to extend, you in essence have 20 years of predictability and continuity in that space. In this particular case, what I'm highlighting here, doctors, is that in 90% of the option provisions that I review, the number one problem in the option is that the the option is exercisable only by the tenant. So hypothetically, you have two years of remaining term on your lease, and you have two five-year options to extend, and you market your practice when you're going through a sale process as having 12 years of remaining term. What ends up happening is the doctor that purchases your practice essentially inherits the remaining two years of lease term but does not have the legal right to exercise the two five-year options to extend because they're non-transferable. Number two, if the tenant has regularly paid its rent and has performed its covenants and obligations under this lease and has not been in default, it shall have the option to renew the lease. Now the real problem here, doctors, is that in the country, the average animal health practitioner is in default typically three times over a 10-year span. 
And what I mean by that is default can mean many different things. Default can mean lack of payment of rent. It can mean if the shopping center has business hours of Monday to Friday, 8 to 8, and you close for business on Fridays. There are a number of reasons why you go into default. And I would encourage every one of you to look at your leases and look at your default provisions. You'll actually be quite surprised at how onerous the default provisions are on, on you as a tenant. And so in this particular case, in no way does it say anything about the landlord having to notify you that you've been in default. And B, it doesn't provide you with the ability to cure or remedy the default. So if you have a 10-year lease and you're in default or have ever been in default, you've lost the option to extend. Number three, any such renewal shall be on the landlord's then current standard form lease. Doctors, this is a very problematic sentence in the option provision because ultimately what it states is that you will contractually obligate yourself to a lease agreement you've never seen or read. You've done a wonderful job in negotiating a very fair lease agreement. When you exercise the option to extend, you've obligated yourself to a lease that you've never had the privilege of reviewing or have had the opportunity to have an advisor review it for you. Number four, when you exercise the option to extend, in no event shall rent be less than the rent paid in the last year of the original term. This is probably my favorite sentence in option provisions because ultimately what it states, doctors, is that rent will never go down. We have several clients now that are in South Florida that signed lease agreements in 2005 and 2006 when the commercial real estate market was on fire, and they're paying from $40 to $50 a square foot in base rent. And these landlords have vacant space in their buildings, and they're marketing incoming tenants at $10, $11, $12 a square foot. But with this one single sentence in the lease agreement that basically obligates you to pay at least what you paid in the prior year of term, your rent will never go down. And the last bullet point, doctors, as it relates to the option provision, is that if you're not able to come to agreement with the landlord on what the base rent shall be, and bear in mind that it won't be less than what it was in the prior year of term, the landlord's going to want to put you through an arbitration process, or they'll want to base it on the last renewing tenant in the building. And doctors, this is very highly problematic, because if the last renewing tenant in the building was Walmart or 7-Eleven, or a Walgreens, there's no way that it's reasonable and fair that your rent negotiation be based on the last renewing tenant in the building. The second provision, doctors, that I want to spend just a few minutes on is the assignment and subletting provision, notably assignment. For any of you on this call today that are contemplating a purchase of a clinic or a sale of a clinic, the assignment provision is the most important provision and covenant in the office lease agreement. Essentially, what the assignment provision provides for is the mechanism by which the landlord will either approve or reject the request on your part to transfer the lease from yourself to a purchaser. And it is essential, doctors, that this provision be structured well, particularly for those of you that are thinking about a sale within the next three to five years. The first problem doctors with the assignment provision here as it's displayed on your screens, is that it requires you to get the consent of the landlord. It doesn't say anything here about what reasonable or unreasonable consent is. It doesn't provide any mechanism by which the landlord will either determine the credit worthiness of the prospective purchaser of your business. It simply states you have to get the consent of the landlord. And we have countless examples, doctors, of, of, of you know, situations where, where our clients have been put in this situation where landlords simply deny consent. And in one of our most famous examples, we had a landlord basically threaten to terminate the lease, raise the rent, or ask the doctor for payment of the proceeds of the sale. So if the doctor sells the practice for a million dollars, the landlord says to you, pay me 20% of the proceeds of the sale of the practice and I'll approve the, I'll approve the transfer. 
And how does the landlord do this? Very simply. In this particular case, simply by you as the tenant requesting of the landlord the right to transfer the lease, you have given this landlord the option to either terminate the lease or to revise the minimum rent to be paid during the remainder of the term. So in essence, you have now given this landlord the right to terminate your lease simply by requesting to assign or transfer the lease from yourself or your corporation to the purchasers. Doctors, it is absurd that this landlord has a termination right. And when we talk about wealth protection, you could imagine that after building a business for a career and thinking about its eventual sale, and then ultimately enjoying the proceeds of the sale to carry you into retirement, if the landlord denies the transfer and disallows the sale of your business, what happens to wealth? It's a very bad day for the doctor. One of the most significant problems, doctors, that remain in this particular example is that the tenant shall not be released from its obligations under the lease and shall remain liable for any failure of the tenant or its assignees or subtenants to observe each and every covenant of the lease. So you basically sell your clinic, I purchase it, the landlord approves the transfer or the assignment, but unfortunately continues to hold me responsible and liable for the terms and conditions of the lease. And so my most recent example here, doctors, of this particular ongoing or continued liability dilemma was a doctor in Michigan who sold his clinic and relocated to Scottsdale, Arizona. Within the first year, the purchaser of the clinic defaulted on the lease and went bankrupt. And the landlord is now suing the doctor who is living in Scottsdale. And so it is essential, doctors, for those of you that are thinking of selling your clinics, that there not be ongoing or continued liability in the lease. Ongoing and continued liability poses an incredible risk to any of you that are thinking of selling, because ultimately what, what you're agreeing to is to be in the line of fire if in the event the purchaser of your business defaults or goes bankrupt. And doctors, due to the, the time constraints of the webinar, when we run our full programs, we speak for hours on this, but there are, there are many other very significant traps and issues in office leases that have an absolute impact on protecting and preserving wealth and protecting your estate. I'm going to just talk about a few of these which are very relevant to this webinar. Um, on the left-hand side, death and disability. Death and disability, doctors, is a provision or covenant that gets written into a lease that essentially does one very basic thing. God forbid you pass, the estate has an immediate termination right of the lease, or God forbid you become disabled, you have the ability to terminate the lease. And doctors, what I can tell you is every single veterinarian lease agreement should have a death and disability provision built into it. It is essential and it is the cheapest insurance policy you will ever buy because God forbid you become disabled and you can no longer practice. It is essential that you have the ability to terminate the lease. If in the event, God forbid, you pass, typically the advice that I give the estate or the executor of a will is that we have to sell the clinic, the practice immediately because for every 30 days that passes, the value of the clinic declines dramatically. So death and disability provision, doctors, it is essential that it be built into your lease agreement. Right above death and disability, doctors, there are two other provisions, demolition and relocation. A demolition provision essentially provides for the landlord being able to terminate your lease should if in the event they want to redevelop or demolish the building. And that's a huge problem, doctors, because ultimately there is a lot of redevelopment going on throughout the country, and they should not have the right to terminate your lease. If they want to redevelop or you know, essentially build out their plazas or their strip plazas, they should compensate you for it. Relocation, a below demolition, is another great example where 
In many lease agreements, landlords have the right to relocate you within 30 days notice. And for a veterinary clinic, what would it do if it was served with a 30-day relocation notice? It could never move in 30 days. And so what happens is you go dark. The landlord evicts you in 30 days. And if it takes you three or four or five or six months, as we often learn from our colleagues and partners at Henry Schein, that a process to build out an, a veterinary clinic, it takes time. And for the right reasons, doctors, because it requires a very significant investment, a lot of planning and project management that the Shine team is actually amazing at doing, and that ultimately, you know, there's a process to find a location, to design the clinic, to hire a general contractor. And so if you have a 30-day relocation provision in your lease, and your landlord serves you with a 30-day notice to relocate, that is a terrible day for a veterinarian. For those of you that are thinking of selling your clinics, quite frankly, if I am consulting with a young doctor looking to buy and I see a relocation clause in that lease agreement for the purchase that they're considering buying, then my advice to the young doctor or the young associate is, we're going to pay significantly less for this practice because you're going to inherit the liability and the risk of the possible relocation. We've talked extensively about personal guarantees, which I'm not a fan of. Um, exclusivity provisions on the right-hand side, approximately five or six bullet points down, doctors, is essential. If you are on this webinar today and you're thinking about starting a clinic or potentially purchasing a clinic, exclusivity is a very important covenant, which ultimately prohibits the landlord from putting a competing veterinarian in the center or the strip plaza or the shopping mall next to you. Exclusivity doctors accomplishes two things. Number one, exclusivity is great for protecting you while you're a tenant in that particular commercial center. And B, for those of you that are thinking of selling, exclusivity has a great impact on value because people will pay more knowing they won't have a competitor immediately next to them. The last one that I want to talk about, doctors, is this last bullet point on the right-hand side, financial statements. Financial statements is an amazing uh, covenant that landlords are getting smarter and smarter and in including in leases. And essentially what it states is that anytime they want, they can request your personal and your corporate books. This is very common in leases, particularly in, 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 in veterinary leases. And so rhetorically, guys, I would ask you a simple question. Why would your landlord want to see your personal and your corporate books? The answer is very simple, because they want to see the health of the practice or the clinic. And very commonly, doctors, what's happening is that the landlords or the landlord brokers or landlord reps are requesting your financials prior to your lease renewals. If they see that your clinic revenue is growing by 10% per year, then you can guarantee yourself that your rent will increase by at least that portion proportion. So there's no way that we would allow a landlord to ever look at your personal or your corporate books. I don't agree with that. I'm just fundamentally opposed to it. As we come to the close of the talk and the webinar, doctors, just a few final points. The critical lease terms. Number one, please, doctors, have lots of term in your lease. And I'm a very big believer in a 10-year lease with options to extend, at least two. There's a client that I'm working with now who's trying to sell his clinic, and he's a month-to-month -month tenant, which basically means he has no lease agreement. And this doctor is having a hard time sell his clinic. And I'm telling him the reason, doctor, you're having a hard time selling your clinic is because there's no lease agreement in place. Why on earth would a young doctor pay you $500,000 to purchase your clinic knowing that the landlord can either terminate the lease with 30 days notice, or B, the landlord can put a new lease agreement in front of the purchaser, and instead of paying $18 a square foot, they can ask you to pay $38 a square foot. Number three, doctors, let's try to eliminate personal exposure in your leases. This is critically important from an estate protection perspective, particularly for those of you that are over 60, that are thinking very carefully about protecting estates. And doctors, I say this very respectfully, it is critical that you either eliminate or cap how much guarantee you provide to the landlord. Number four, 
be very careful with assignment provisions because, again, for those of you that are thinking of either buying or particularly those that are thinking of selling, it is essential that we structure the assignment provisions as well so that the landlord can't terminate or deny the request to assign or transfer the lease. And then lastly, doctors, death and disability. Every one of you on this webinar today presumably is paying a lot of money for life insurance and term insurance and disability insurance, life insurance, et cetera. You insert a death and disability provision into your lease agreement, it is the cheapest insurance policy you will ever buy. And one final point on death and disability, doctors. What I find very commonly, particularly in the metropolitan areas, is that when a, when a clinic gets sold, the purchaser is very often a competing doctor that does not want your location. What they want are your clients and your files. They want goodwill only. So if there's a death and disability provision in your lease and God forbid there's a passing, very often what I find happen is that the purchaser of the clinic immediately terminates the lease and simply moves equipment over to their existing clinic as well as the patients and the charts and, and the goodwill. I haven't spent a lot of time on the tenant lease cycle, but one very important point here, doctors, for any of you that are presently commercial tenants and in a lease agreement, it is essential, doctors, that you know when your leases expire. And very respectfully, doctors, 50% of the time when I ask a veterinarian doctor, when does your lease expire, the answer I commonly get is, Alan, I do not know. Or I don't have a copy of my lease. So my advice to you all today from an estate perspective, particularly from a wealth point of view, is know exactly when your leases expire, number one. Number two, please have a copy of your lease agreement available to you. And number three, typically we advise our clients to start negotiating their lease renewals 24 months prior to the expiry of their leases. And that's a key point, doctors, because ultimately the closer you get to your lease expiry, the less leverage you have. If I'm your landlord and I know that it will take you six months to a year to move and will cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars, and I know that it's highly unlikely that you want to relocate your clinics, then what most landlords are taught across the country is to start negotiating a renewal with a veterinarian within 30 days of lease expiry. And doctors, this is interesting because I often lecture at the International Council of Shopping Centers, which is a school and, a, and an academy training uh, landlords and landlord reps and landlord brokers, it's a very commonly known fact that healthcare practitioners, so veterinarians, doctors, dentists, that have very significant investments in leaseholds, that are very highly unlikely to move, that basically will have to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars to move, are the easiest prey. And what I mean by that, doctors, is if you're paying $18 a square foot and I start negotiating your lease renewal 30 days prior to your lease expiry, all I have to do is threaten you with the termination notice and you will agree to virtually anything that is presented to you. So please, doctors, know when your lease expires and have a copy of your lease agreement. It is essential that you keep those documents available to you and handy on file. I'm not going to get into a very detailed discussion on our process, but very briefly, doctors, we've really, over, over 25 years roughly, built a great process for the analysis and the negotiation of an office lease. But if any of you are interested in basically going on it on your own, then this is a great process, essentially a seven-step process whereby you should gather all your documentation, you should review your lease and identify the risks and traps, things like relocation provisions and personal guarantees, et cetera. You should do some market research. You should try to design an outcome strategy. And what I mean by that is, if you're a 31-year-old young associate with $250,000 of student loans and debt, it's a very different strategy as opposed to a 62-year-old doctor who is two years away from transition. Then you're going to negotiate financials, 
and documentation, and doctors, at the end of the process, before you execute or sign any document ever, please review it before you sign it. We have countless examples here of doctors that sign one or two page lease amending agreements because they think they're very simple one or two page lease agreements, amendments, and unfortunately they waive their options to extend, they agree to termination rates, so please, doctors, before you ever sign anything, review it. Some of the key takeaways on the webinar. Number one, the details in your office lease can cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars if left alone. Lease agreements are not just about rent. They really are about minimizing risk, maximizing flexibility and practice value, and achieving long-term peace of mind. Doctors, please be strategic. You don't get what you deserve, you get what you negotiate. It's something I think that we've all heard time and time again. Start the process early. For those of you that are renewing a lease or those of you that are thinking of selling, don't wait until you get to the end of your lease. Start the process very early. And then finally, do your homework and your research and ensure you have a plan. I want to thank everyone for the time today on this webinar. We covered quite a bit of material in approximately 40 minutes. I'm going to open up to questions. So if any of you have any questions uh, specific to the webinar or any of the materials that we covered, please feel free to either type them in or ask away. So the first question is, my lease is in my personal name. Does this mean that if I pass away suddenly, my estate inherits the lease liability? And the answer to the question is, unfortunately, yes. So what happens when a doctor passes is the estate, as determined by the will, will execute essentially the dissolution of the, of the estate. And when you personally sign off on a lease agreement, your estate inherits the liability. Any other questions, doctors? Like somebody is typing? How do I ensure the lease is not a hurdle when having my clinic appraised and marketed to be sold? So that's a great question. The best advice I can give you all is as you start to develop a transition plan, again, and this applies to either purchasers or sellers, the best piece of advice that I can give you before you engage in any discussions with the landlord is to essentially have the lease agreement reviewed. And what I mean by that, doctors, is, you know, I review several leases each day for doctors that are thinking of selling, and essentially what we do is we want to analyze the lease for two things. Number one, we want to do analysis on the economics. We want to ensure that you're not overpaying in rent or your operating costs aren't unreasonable or high. And B, we want to vet out what risks and traps there are in the lease agreement to develop a plan to renegotiate them well before we market and sell the practice. That's a great question. Any other questions, doctors? We'll just give everyone another minute because it looks like somebody is typing. It looks like we're just waiting for one answer to come through. One question, sorry. What can I expect to pay to have my lease reviewed? So great question. Um, we're, we're delighted, doctors, to announce that through our partnership with Henry Schein, that as a, as a, as a customer to, to, to Henry Schein Animal Health, we will um, analyze a lease agreement and provide a complimentary consultation to any of you that want to take advantage of one. And so, for the two folks that just basically asked pretty much the same question, um, at the end of the webinar, as you get, I believe it gets emailed to you all, um, 
somebody from our office will be available, including myself, to offer a complimentary analysis and consultation. So the, the short answer is there's no cost. The, the second question that I just got in is what are the fees and how long does it take to schedule? Um, so the fees really depend largely on the work effort, but the best advice that I can give you doctors is let's start out with a lease review. I mean, that's a great starting point and there's no cost to you for the lease review. It's a complimentary service that we provide as a courtesy to Henry Schein, our strategic partner. Uh, typically what will happen is you will send us a copy of your lease agreement, your amendments, your supporting documentation, and within three business days, we will schedule the consultation with you, and we will basically guide you through every part of the lease. And so again, it's complimentary, and you can simply email me direct for that. Um, the last question here that we'll take today, if you own your own property business and want to redevelop the property, meaning you need you need to move out for some time, what do you recommend for short-term leases elsewhere? So great question and not, not such an easy answer because ultimately if you own your own property and you are in the process of redeveloping it, ultimately what's going to happen is you are going to have to find a short-term home and the negotiation strategy there is very different in that if you ask a prospective landlord for a one or two year commitment, the landlord is going to want you to overpay in base rent. And they may be unreasonable, quite frankly, in what they ask of you because, frankly, landlords don't necessarily often like short-term leases. So my advice to the person who asked is I would be more than happy to take that conversation offline to really just get a bit more of an understanding of the specific situation. But we need to be very careful with how much we present to the landlord that we ultimately want to secure short-term space for. Wonderful. I want to thank everybody today for the time. It's been delightful to speak to you all about the content on wealth and estate protection. I will ensure that my contact details are available such that if any of you want to take us up on a complimentary consultation, it would be our pleasure to do so. And again, I want to thank everyone for their time. Thank you. participants.